So we are now um, broadcasting at the moment. So, good morning everybody. Thank you for attending the meeting of the Cabinet. Whilst this meeting is open to the public, it is being recorded and broadcast live on the County Council's website and will be available for repeat viewing. It may also be recorded and filmed by the press and public. Filming or recording is only permitted in this room whilst the meeting is taking place, so it must stop when the meeting is either adjourned or closed. Filming is not permitted elsewhere in the building at any time. We are not expecting a fire drill today, but in the event that there is a fire alarm, please vacate via the main reception and via one of the emergency exits across the hall. Okay, so good morning. We first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. We have apologies from Councillor Rob Humby today. Joe, have we got any other apologies at all? No other apologies, Chairman. Thank you. Declarations of interest. If any Cabinet member with a disclosable pecuniary interest or a personal interest in any of the items on the agenda, can you please declare this either now or at the time of the item um, by first indicating that you, you wish to speak? Do we have any declarations of interest today? No? Okay. So let's get back into the, the bulk of the agenda. So the first item the, the, um, for us to consider on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. Are we all happy and content that that is a true reflection of the meeting last time? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, members. Chairman's announcement is agenda item four. So... I have some notes from, from Rob to announce. So the first um, announcement to make is that on the 1st of April, the functions of the Local Enterprise Partnership covering the County Council geography were officially transferred to Hampshire County Council. I would like to say a warm welcome to the staff who have joined the County Council from the Enterprise M3 LEP two weeks ago. We are very pleased to have this opportunity to drive forward the County Council's plans to enhance our economic development and business support role in Hampshire. We are currently in the process of jointly establishing our new governance, including developing a single joint leaders board to ensure the involvement of every district council in Hampshire, alongside a new Hampshire Prosperity Partnership Board. The Prosperity Board will ensure that Hampshire businesses of all sizes have the chance to engage directly with the County Council and will make their voices heard as we shape our future plans. I'll have more to say on this soon. For now, I would like to reinstate, restate, restate that my thanks to everyone who supported the Enterprise M3 LEP and the Solent LEP to play a value, valuable role in helping to drive investment in Hampshire and bringing local partners together over the last decade. I remain committed to working collaboratively and constructively with all partners within the County Council's boundary and the neighbouring authorities to exercise LEP functions in the best and most responsible manner for the benefit of all residents and businesses right across Hampshire. Now to move on to Southern Water. In February, Rob and other leaders in Hampshire met with representatives, including the Chief Executive of Southern Water, to hear about the company is doing to improve their services and infrastructure and ensure reliable water supplies for Hampshire residents. We had an open and positive discussion and we were encouraged by Southern Water's willingness to take on board our suggestions of improvement. We agreed to set up further meetings with Southern Water in order to continue development on constructive partnership-based approach to supporting the ongoing improvement of water services to Southern Water customer ha customers in Hampshire. SEND Youth Forum. I'm delighted that the County Council has launched a new SEND Youth Forum. The new forum will create opportunities for young people with special educational needs or disabilities across Hampshire to share their views directly with the council decision makers on issues that affect them, such as education, training and employment. I would like to congratulate and thank the learners currently enrolled in the County Council Support inter Internship Programme for helping officers set up the forum. For more information on the SEND Youth Forum, there, this is available on our website. 
Finally, the Hauk Conference. Councillor Humby had the honour of giving an opening speech at the Hampshire Association of Local Councils annual conference last month. He spoke about the Hampshire 2050 vision and the November summit, which formally relaunched the Hampshire 2050 partnership that will deliver the vision. The Hampshire Association of Local Councils is a member of the Hampshire 2050 partnership. In his speech, he emphasised that parish and town councils will play a crucial role in develop, helping to develop and deliver the Hampshire 2050 vision and ensure that Hampshire has a great places to live, work, play and visit for the current and future generations. He would also like to take the opportunity to thank everyone associated with parish and town councils, from councillors to clerks to volunteers, for another year of outstanding service in communities across Hampshire. That's it for the Chairman's announcements. Item 5 is deputations. We have no deputations today, so that moves us on to Agenda Item 6, which is driving towards economic strength, and Gary is going to present this paper. Good morning, uh, Deputy Leader. Good morning, Cabinet. So um, what you have from me is the usual report on driving towards economic strength across Hampshire. You'll see in the report that the economic picture remains um, extremely challenging and makes reference to the UK entering recession at the end of last calendar year, um, which we believe, as you'll see in the report, was a trend mirrored in Hampshire. Looking forward, both nationally and regionally, economic growth is likely to be, uh, remain subdued for the year ahead as markets continue to navigate uncertainty, higher costs of borrowing, high, albeit falling inflation, and labour market shortages. That said, you'll see some important new investments and acquisitions detailed in paragraphs 44 and 45 of your report, demonstrating that Hampshire remains an area of significant investment and new economic activity. The paper, as the deputy leader has also referred to, covers our local enterprise partnership integration update. Um, with roles and responsibilities for call-up functions transferring into Hampshire for our upper tier local authority area from the 1st of April, so about two weeks ago. This includes the core funding detailed in paragraph 67, um, and I'm also pleased to uh, confirm that following the, uh, the publication of the report, um, Growth Hub funding, which is one of the major government programmes that is cascaded down uh, from central government, has now been confirmed for our area, with once again the County Council being the key upper tier accountable authority for our single county geography. The paper also confirms uh, the approach that's been taken to the disaggregation of assets, liabilities and staff transfers, as well as that important new governance that's been established under the Hampshire Prosperity Partnership Board, which is the key mechanism for shaping our economic strategy and supporting investment and growth. You'll see in the paper that the board has been in shadow form since earlier this year, and you will see also the intention to formalise the appointments to this board at an executive member decision day in May. So finally, I'd like to refer Cabinet to recommendations two to five in the report and would welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Members, Councillor Warwick. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Chad, and thank you, Gary, for your paper, which is always an interesting read. It, it refers to the sort of sluggish economic recovery within Hampshire um, and the employment challenge, although I, I note today that we saw a small increase in unemployment and, and that would be interesting to see what you think about how that will pan out in Hampshire. But how will the new prosperity board governance help to support and turn around this economic position? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warwick. We're obviously listening to the same uh, radio programme on the route into work this morning. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, relationship between um, sort of a healthy ageing population and economic prosperity, which was being discussed in terms of worklessness and the figures now quoted at 25% of the available labour market is, is, is currently out of work. And a lot of that is down to um, the health primarily of older individuals either exiting the workforce or not returning to the workforce uh, post-COVID. Um, you'll see within the um, within the paper that actually Hampshire does have the benefit of um, really positive statistics in terms of that healthy workforce population. And the paper makes reference to the fact that we 
we track above the national averages um, in terms of that, in terms of those who are available to work um, are, are in work. And I think that te that's testament to a healthy ageing population in our area. Um, but clearly what that does mask when you look at any averages is those pockets where that is both higher and lower than the national average. And we do make reference in the paper, there are certain areas of the county where you have that entrenchment of, of, of long-term unemployment, which, which sits above those national averages. Um, in terms of the, um, the economic recovery, I think that it would be unrealistic for me to sort of say that, you know, the, those new responsibilities coming down to our area will, um, you know, fundamentally turn a corner in terms of um, an economic landscape, much of which is outside of our direct control in terms of the things like, you know, labour market availability, inflation, um, those national and international financial conditions. So um, given that context, um, what the Prosperity Board does give us is that ability to be more joined up on a strategic perspective over the, over the short to medium term. What it do, does give us is that autonomy and direction and control around investment and new government money that I've referred to that will come down. And that's both as part of this initial wave, but also any future investment pots that come down to our area. But coming back to your first point, I think that the single biggest opportunity is around the alignment of the skills um, that we have in our area and the alignment with businesses both in terms of the jobs of today within our area, but also those future jobs as well. Um, and we know that that sort of match between the skills in an area and the jobs in an area will be a really important economic ingredient for the future. So I think that's um, you know, the, biggest, um, the biggest thing and, and opportunity we have as part of our new governance and accountabilities. Thank you, Harry. Councillor Oppenheimer. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for the report, Gary. Um, I want to ask about paragraphs 80 and 81, where you've referred to the establishment of the Prosperity Board and its relationship with our democratic decision making. Um, can I ask how will this work in practice to ensure that the Prosperity Board is an appropriately empowered and meaningful board and the members of the board feel that they, they have the real clout that, that these senior people will understandably want to feel they have? Thank you, Councillor Oppenheimer. It's something that's firmly in the forefront of our minds in terms of um, when we talk about those those senior individuals with clout having, you know, going through that that shortlisting and appointment for the board. We're very help, hopeful of, you know, significantly kind of influential and well respected individuals being both members of those democratic boards. So the deputy leaders mentioned the joint leaders board, which is part of that governance. Um, and then also the uh, prosperity partnership, which is where we involve um, the skills providers, universities um, and business groups and so on. And making sure, as you've said, that that decision making is really, really meaningful and empowering um, rather than just being you know, subservient to um, democratic decision making. Um, you'll see within the report that it's really important that we have that democratic dimension in terms of decision making because the book ultimately stops with Hampshire County Council as the accountable body and government have been really, really clear about that in terms of making local authorities and upper tier local authorities absolutely accountable for that decision making. But we're confident in terms of the way we've constructed that governance and having that read across between the various governance groups in terms of our skills partnership, our business forums and our two really important boards in terms of our joint leaders board and our prosperity partnership. So they then have those meaningful connections um, in terms of the democratic decision making. In terms of a couple of practical examples around how that could work in practice, though, one is around delegation. So one thing we do know is that we need sort of swift and relevant decision making. And we're not waiting, having got a re recommendation out of a prosperity board, then waiting three to six months for it to kind of be ratified by democratic governance uh, cycles. So as with any, um, you know, county council governance, we can give delegations appropriately to officers to move forward off the back of recommendations um, within some parameters for those boards. The other thing that also we're setting up, which is absolutely within our gift, is the really important ordering of decision making. And, and, and a really simple but practical example is about you know, two to three weeks before an executive member decision cycle, we can land those prosperity boards. So almost you're taking those decisions in real time and then there's an appropriate ratification through a democratic cycle. The final thing to note is that, you know, as we go into this, we're slightly learning by doing this is new responsibilities um, and new, um, new, new ways of governance and new ways of working. So clearly what we'll build into that as well is six month and 12 month review. So if we do need to tweak the governance accordingly, we've got the ability to do that as well. That's a very reassuring answer. 
Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Councillor Oppenheimer. Is there any other questions from members on this particular paper? No? Okay, so if I can take members, thank you, Gary, to the recommendations that are on page 25 and 26, and it's paragraph 2 to 5. Are we all in agreement for those recommendations? Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the annual report of the Director of Public Health, and I'd like to invite Simon Bryant, Director of Public Health, to introduce this item, please. Many thanks uh, for the introduction. So I'm here to present my Director of Public Health annual report. It's an independent report that I have a duty to write uh, each year. Uh, the top of which is my choosing. I'm very grateful for my team here who've helped me write the report. I wanted to see it in its final part of the journey. I've chosen this year to focus on childhood obesity, which is a really important uh, health issue uh, that we need to address. It feels like something that, uh, rather than um, a health issue, that's it just kind of grows and grows. And we, it, excuse the pun, but we just need to really kind of start to think about how we tackle that problem. So I've highlighted some of the things that I think we should do in the report. Uh, most importantly, the recommendation that we all need to work together with all our partners, uh, taking our public health leadership role as the authority to uh, take that action. So I endorse the report to you uh, and welcome any questions. Thank you, Simon. Um, at this point, I would like to invite Councillor Jackie Porter to just say um, some words on this and then I'll invite Cabinet for questions. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Brown will be delighted to say that I fully agree with this paper. <laughs> I'm sure you will be too. Um, reducing obesity in early life is a really good start to remaining at a healthy weight for life, for the whole your whole life. The paper offers the opportunity for all agencies involved with children to consider how they can contribute to this aim. Uh, and I'd like to find a way to include the children themselves and parents in this partnership too. Uh, because, for example, in perceived safety and length of routes to school, we know we hit a barrier the moment change is proposed. For the county's part, there are valuable lessons I've learned as we negotiate change with parents and children and ask Hampshire County Council to consider how we can promote active lifestyles for children. For example, Removal of school routes, of school buses on routes at Worthy Down has brought more children as a result being taken to school by car than actually walked before. I urge Hampshire County Council to find ways to manage this change better. And uh, you will know as well that we've struggled with that in, in the Worthies. We've struggled to find a way of making it attractive to parents to change from being on a, in transport onto their own two feet. So, uh, and much as you can try as a community leader, if there are hundreds of parents affected, it's very hard to change the way they think. And I think that we could do a lot better in managing that change. Rural schools require children to be taken to school by bus. And they don't take them on the bus at four years old. I, I even asked a school uh, locally about why the children don't come to school on the bus. And he said he likes to meet those parents. So actually they're bringing their children literally to the classroom door. And that's not a healthy that doesn't help the healthy weight conversation. School lunch, schools with school lunch times and inferior lunch facilities mean that many children themselves resort to a snack-style lunch, whether a free school meal or not. And I welcome Park Community School good practice. I think that's really impressive and hope that we can extend that further on. School swimming lessons are often stripped down to the minimum offer because of the cost of the bus transport to, pool, to a pool. But swimming is a life skill that could be used to maintain healthy weight and strength throughout childhood and into adult life and into old age. Is there anything that we as the County Council could do to help that too? So I'd like to hear as well about the value of investment in the healthy town of Whitehill and Borden. I'm such an old timer here that at the time I, that that investment was agreed, I suggested it would be useful to compare the outcomes of this population with the King's Barton population being constructed at the same time. That didn't have healthy weight, uh, that didn't have a healthy town status. Many children in King's Barton are transported by car to other schools because the school didn't admit pupils in higher years, so they started at the low years and joined on. So there are children there who, have, who go to other schools. As a result, 
When I ask parents why they take their child to school by car, even though it's only a few hundred yards away, it's actually the transport by car to the other school and the time pressure to get the children to the schools at the same time. So those children don't have the chance of even learning to, to walk to school, even though they're just a few hundred yards away, which is terrible. Finally, thank you. Thankfully, children of all of both sexes are now play, enjoying playing team sports. Please, can Hampshire County Council not skimp on playing field space in future times um, in the new schools and in those reducing in size? Play spaces at school designed to be available to parents after school is also a really positive step too. So many of them are restricted because of the complications of caretaking, etc. So I'm just trying to find ways in which we could man help parents and help county council to manage that change that we're aiming to do so that by 2020, 20, by 2020, every child is actually having their hour of activity every single day. But I fully endorse this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. I think Simon wants to just come back. Quickly. Yeah, many thanks. And it's, it's great to have your endorsement. I think you've really highlighted the challenges of this complex issue. It's not a simple issue to solve. I think uh, it's often seen as a it can be seen as a health issue, uh, and it is a really health important health problem, but actually the health service isn't going to solve it. We work really closely and really well with colleagues around the uh, CMT and cabinet table on things like planning, and you're right, we need to address those issues, and we do that. Um, and it is complicated. There is something about how do we uh, work in a way for families to help them change behaviour, both eating and activity, and that's the reason that I've brought this report forward, to really bring that um, action uh, together. I think there are some simple things that we do do well with schools, such as the Golden Mile and other things. So I think it's how we bring all that together for a real systems approach to tackling childhood obesity. Thank you. Members, do I have any questions from the Cabinet at all on this item? Councillor Nick Holmes King. So, um, uh, I feel um, uh, somewhat reluctant to talk about obesity given my size, um, but I do the best I can. Um, and uh, but I think, Simon, this is a really good piece of work. Uh, and I think there are clearly very many things that we can influence through schools and through our um, uh, children's services. Um, but I wonder whether um, you can perhaps give us a few ideas of how we might be able to then work with other partners and sort of other stakeholders to encourage a wider uh, recognition of the issue and, and how we also take children and families with us when some of the things about which we're talking can be inconvenient or, or um, not the most um, attractive thing for them immediately. Or they're not, not attractive because they're not easy is the issue. You quite raise it's a really sensitive issue and I absolutely appreciate that and this isn't about uh, fat shaming or anything like that, it's about health. So that's where we're at and that's the conversation we need to have with our colleagues. I think this, for me there's something about how do we enable people to have that conversation, particularly if they're meeting a medical professional or someone who's, a, who's in the space to say actually how do we tackle weight on an individual level. And then I think as uh, Councillor Porter raised and I responded, there's things we can do with our district council around planning and around takeaways and we do do that. Do we need more fast food outlets? And we have had conversations with some districts about, you know, do you need another one? The health benefits are not there. So we can do some of those kind of things. I think we're also seeing that the messaging is mixed and we need to be really clear across all our partners what we are trying to achieve and what we're trying to say. We want people to be a healthy weight because it's really good for their health. And then linked back to uh, Gary's paper, actually the long-term implications, we know that the issues that people um, may experience in the long term could be related to childhood obesity, things like diabetes and heart disease. So I think it's really having that open and honest conversation going, it is difficult. I think the other thing that we really need to do, and it's great we've got some partnerships with our universities, because actually let's do some research it's a fairly under-researched area, except in the treatment bit where people go to weight management classes. It's not about that. It's about all of us. How do we move more? How do we eat healthier? It's complicated, and we need to bring families on board, and I'm really keen to do that as well. Thank you. Councillor Heron. Oh, thank you. Uh, just, just picking up on that, because um, I think all of us who stood at the school date, partic gate, particularly when the letters have gone out, um, after the national child measurements have gone, um, have heard the, the responses. And to be honest, quite often, 
um, the responses are quite negative from parents, that they feel that um, they're being criticised, um, they feel that um, their children are being attacked, and, and that's how parents respond. If you tell a parent there's something, anything minor about their child, they, they will naturally and instinctively leap to their, their defence. And so I think that there is work to do here, and I'll certainly say from my life, I think, um, how we can... But that, that brings on to my question, because I think, do you think that, and you just touched on it, that the implications of childhood obesity are well understood with the public and parents? Uh, because I, you're never going to convince parents you're trying to help them unless there's that understanding that that actually you're, you're trying to be honest to protect their child, you're trying to give them the information to make their child have a healthier, longer, happier life. So do you think that understanding among the public of why we're concerned about childhood obesity is there? And if not, what can we do to try and increase that message? I think you're absolutely right, Councillor Heron. Uh, a story that struck me, a friend of mine showed their child a picture of them at school and the child said, why is everyone so thin? So I think it's almost like we've got a little bit lost in understanding what obesity is and how we then support families and um, everyone to understand what, what we can do and how we can change that message and why it's important. Uh, so no, I don't think the understanding's there. I don't think the understanding's there across uh, many agencies. So I think one of our roles and one of the things I'm going to do is bring together a summit to really explain that and to really work together. But working with our expert in communications and insight to talk to the parents, say actually what would help you? Let's not, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, we've done some really good work on immunizations during COVID because we talked to the people who weren't taking up the vaccination. Actually, we changed actions. So how do we do that and really do it sensitively so that we do, the parents don't feel criticised? The NCMP letter is nationally written and it's really clunky and I don't think it's the best way to communicate to parents. Uh, we are working on that to see if we can uh, work a way that enables parents to change behaviour and understand why we're doing it and why we're concerned. Thank you. Councillor Forster. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. And Simon, thank you for the report. I I've got one question. Um, I'm very familiar with what we do in Hampshire Education education catering services, which is very fo very much focused on good quality food and the education of both children and their families um, around health eating. But of course, that only supports a, a limited number of our schools because many of the secondaries choose to go their own way. And of course, the independent schools. And I just wondered, are we taking what we learn from education catering services, which we run, um, and also engaging with uh, with other schools uh, to do similar. I think I'd answer it partially. I think you're right. You know, HC3S does a great job, a challenging job, trying to feed a number of children in a healthy way. Uh, I think what I would say from my perspective, I don't think we quite understand the benefit that brings that we can then really uh, shout about that to other education food providers. So I think... You know, part of my suggestion of bringing it together is because I don't think we've brought all partners in the room and said, this is what we really need to do. And then we can be a bold uh, and considerate leader to say, this is what we would like others to think about. Uh, because obviously we don't have responsibility if we're not in charge of their catering. But I think you're right, we could do some more learning. And there have been some successes from around the country and around Hampshire that we could build on. Thank you. Um Thank you, Simon and the team, for this fantastic and, and really important report. And I'm really pleased that it's, it's been highlighted um, today. You mentioned, actually, in one of your responses about a summit that you were um, taking on. And I just wonder if this is something that actually our youth MPs could be involved with going forward. Because I, I think it, there is actually that importance that, yes, getting the parents on board absolutely but sometimes that communication can come better from the children themselves to the to the children so i i would like to think that they, they could be involved in that in some way shape or form going forward 
Absolutely. Uh, there may be something about how uh, we engage the children, young people and families and get their insight and bring them through so that actually they can challenge professionals as well. So yeah, absolutely. And Councillor Fairhurst has agreed to uh, be part of that as well. Fantastic. Well, I think we all look forward to hearing the results of that summit as well um, at a future date. So, as I've said, thank you for the report and thank you to the team for all your hard work on, on this, and it is so important. What I will now do is take the Cabinet to the recommendations, which are on page 47, and it's paragraph 2. Are we all happy with the recommendations in this report? Thank you, and thank you, Simon, for this morning. Um, the next item is you again. Um, so it's the Local Government Declaration on Tobacco Control. M many thanks. Uh, so uh, the purpose of this report is to uh, seek approval from uh, the, the Cabinet and the Leader uh, to sign the local uh, government declaration of tobacco control. It was quite an important day, both nationally uh, and locally. Uh, this would really uh, provide uh, an opportunity for us to demonstrate again our leadership in terms of health issues and smoking is the biggest cause of ill health. I think Sometimes we feel that the issue of uh, smoking has uh, gone away, but actually we still know that a number of people smoke and they are addicted to tobacco and that is causing ill health. So I'm here to seek uh, support to sign the local government uh, declaration and also take forward some of the actions around uh, smoking, uh, reducing smoking and youth uh, electronic cigarette use. This also uh, partners a paper that Councillor Fairhurst signed off in the exec member decision where the government uh, gave us some funding for tobacco control through the smoke-free generation. So we have uh, the permission to spend and then this is also giving demonstration that we are taking the action required, which are set out in the main in paragraph 15 as a summary. Thank you, Simon. Um, Councillor North, you have a question. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Simon, thanks for this. Um, I'm interested in how we can ensure um, that we have the best support available for um, our staff in our workforce who would like to quit smoking. S supporting our staff is really, really important and really um, good for health and good for our productivity. Uh, and so what we are doing with the new funding is ensure that smoking cessation advice, which includes actually a really innovative VIP, uh, vape quitting service, sorry, I get my tongue around that, um, which is new in the country. So actually people giving up that as well. Uh, we're working with uh, HR colleagues to make sure that kind of lines up so that we are uh, supporting people in the right way, offering uh, quit services and the right pharmacotherapy. So whether that's a patch or something else to help people give up. Uh, and do that in the right way so that we can have a healthy workforce. But also think about the careful messaging. It's not, again, about criticising people. It's about helping people to have a healthier lifestyle. Thank you. Councillor Forster. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm conscious that vaping is quite contentious, certainly with what's going on in government at the moment. It'll be interesting to see how that vote goes. Um, our trading standards officers have done a huge amount. Uh, the work that councillors Oppenheimer, Chad, and many others have been involved in, along with myself, um, to, to focus on reducing vaping by children has been important. But I know that generally there has been a rise in the use of vapes, and sometimes that's beneficial if it weans people off smoking. But do you see it actually as good for quitting smoking or is it bad for the health of young people? So from my perspective, if you don't smoke, don't vape. Fairly clear about that. Uh, if you smoke, vaping is better or e-cigarette use is better uh, because it contains less chemicals. But actually what we don't want to do is move somebody from one addiction to another addiction. I think the thing that has sounded me is the uh, what we saw was a rise in single-use vapes and colourful vapes and flavoured vapes, which would, in my mind, be more attractive to young people rather than as a, a tool uh, for quitting. Uh, part of this legislation going through Parliament is to close that loophole because uh, whilst you couldn't sell to children, you could supply. Uh, so I think 
we need to be clear that e-cigarettes are a great quitting tool and they are good because they the way they work means you get nicotine and you have that habit bit that people want to give up but let's make it absolutely clear i don't think it's good for young people or children to vape Thank you. Councillor Oppenheimer. Thank you very much, Ros. And um, following on from what you just said, Simon, I wanted to just take a moment to say I agree. And, uh, you know, I do support us signing this declaration. And um, I'm actually very proud that at Hampshire we've been ahead of the curve in our crackdown on youth vaping, which we started 18 months ago. And um, trading standards have been out in force, visiting every single vape retail, retailer in the county. There's been a strong deterrent effect from this to, to prevent youth uh, sales, sales to young people under the age of 16. Indeed, two shops were busted for doing exactly that, and they're, they're now under investigation. Um, so I'm proud that, that we were ahead of the curve in, in anticipating this national initiative that the government and others are now doing. Um, you know, I've always been very wary of vaping, but two things over the last sort of 18 months have increased my feeling that, that vaping is something that ultimately is very negative and bad for society. Firstly, you know, over the last 18 months, emerging data has showed a lot of health consequences of vaping. There's a lot of chemicals in vapes that we don't yet fully understand, and we don't know exactly what their long-term implications are going to be. Um, but emerging data from America also is now showing a link with cardiovascular disease, um, asthma, chronic lung disease. Um, these are, you know, very serious conditions, and I think that increases my feeling that we mustn't let children anywhere near these vapes if we can avoid it. And that's, that's for us as a trading standards operation, but also it's for schools and parents to note. But also, I think, you know, I want to say... At the heart of a vape is nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive, toxic substance that, you know, it's not good for children to be exposed to. Um, so, yeah, the data, I think, has increased my feeling about, uh, the, you know, the negative impacts of, of vapes. But the second thing that over the last eight, 18 months has had an impact on me is seeing the mountain of confiscated vapes that we collected. I went to visit the Trading Standards Office about five, six weeks ago, and they've got a shipping container full of confiscated vapes. So there's over 300,000 pounds worth of vapes that have been confiscated. These are vapes that don't meet the regulations. They've got too much chemicals in them. Um, and it's, it's great that we've got these off the streets, but what was really shocking was hearing that they have a real problem disposing of these vapes. There's no obvious thing to do with them. We can't incinerate them because of the batteries. We can't send them to landfill because of the chemicals. They have to be pulled apart, which is a manual process. It's very expensive. Um, and that, that's at the cost of the local taxpayer. Um, it's been suggested to me this morning that we can perhaps send them to Ukraine. And we will look into that because apparently they need the batteries. Um, but that's obviously going to be quite a major shipping operation to send a whole shipping container from Hampshire to Ukraine. But we'll see. Um, but, you know, the, the waste implications of vapes are quite shocking. And I, don't, I just don't think that this is a product that is a responsible thing. Of course, though, I do acknowledge that there is a role for vaping. I should have said that at the beginning. As, as Simon points out, there is a role for vaping for people who have a habit of smoking and they want to, they want to get off that habit then I think, you know, there, there is a justification. I don't, I don't uh, you know, I don't say that we should ban vaping, but I do think disposable vapes should be banned. I'm glad the government is going down that direction. And uh, I do think youth vaping is something we should continue to crack down on, and I'm sure we will. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Oppenheimer. So any other members want to... Councillor Nick Adams-King. Um... Thank you, Deputy Leader. I'll, I'll just say something. Um, I did my own bit of confiscation this morning of a vape. Um, having heard that you should only do it for children under 16, I think I might have made a mistake and may have extended, extended beyond my powers because he is over 16. But even so, every time I find one, I, I take it and I take it down to the HWRC to uh, get rid of it that way. And that, that 
um, is one of the ways by which people can get rid of them. But I, I do, I think this is a great piece of work and um, I, I commend the uh, team in Trading Standards as well for the work they've been doing because um, these single-use vapes, the ones with the um, fruit flavours and the bright colours are really pernicious things. And um, I have a constant battle with my one of my teenagers attempting to do that. And what I am really pleased about is that the other one was born in 2010, so she will never be able to buy tobacco. Um, and she, I think, is still in the uh, place of being the elder brother police in ensuring that she snitches on every vape use that she finds. So um, she therefore is unlikely to want to do anything because it would undermine her, her legitimacy in doing that. But it's a good thing. And it's a good thing that we, we make sure that, that uh, we slowly move this out of um, use because inevitably we see people around us the entire time whose health is blighted in older age by their use of tobacco and I'm sure there'll be a time when there'll be a use, uh, people's use of, of vapes will um, have exactly the same effect. And that is an ongoing burden on all of our services as a consequence of that happening. So um, I think this is a great piece of work. Simon, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Simon, did you want to come back? I feel I may need to come to some parenting advice as well going forward uh, with the age of my children. But interestingly, we wrote to all schools at the beginning of the in the, over the summer twice and one of the most useful pieces of feedback we got was you have helped us understand how to talk to our young people about vaping and I was really I was slightly surprised that that's what the teachers and parents needed rather than actually the fact so we're doing more of that actually and that's probably back to I think Councillor Force's question about how do we talk about childhood obesity how do we help people talk about these issues rather than actually talking about the issue itself so I think it's really helpful so thank you but your story is not unique Thank you. Um, can I just take the opportunity to really congratulate your, you and your team on this piece of work? It's it, it's really good. But also to you know, um, thank Councillor Oppenheimer, Councillor Forster, Councillor Fairhurst, and um, Trading Standards, Children's Services, and Public Health as, as well, and on the work that they've done to really you know, put this at the forefront for Hampshire County Council and really highlight the, the concern to the the public of the, the use of, of vapes um, when not used to, to quit smoking. Um, on that note, I would like to take everyone to page uh, 65 and paragraph 2 um, and seek the approval from Cabinet for this paper. Great. Thank you, everyone. That brings us to the close of today's meeting. Um, can we please stop the broadcast? <laughs>